Welcome back to Light the Fuse right here on Radio One. <laughs> you could have been one of those guys. I mean, I guess you could still be one of those guys. I you could, could still. still be. This, could this be, is like an audition yeah. tape. Yeah, listen. We got. I'm gonna send this into some radio stations. That's great, <laughs> Drew. Drew's up at 4 a.m. to talk about what happened on the Real Housewives last night. That'll be my new. Oh my gosh, I'd tune in. A new radio game. I want this like terrestrial radio <laughs> show for Drew Taylor. Please. We need it. We need Come it. Come on. Yeah, we get. We need it. We need a slot somewhere on terrestrial radio. Somebody give us. Yeah, the... I'll be your. I'll be your like sidekick. That'd be good. Yeah, let's uh, do it. Oh man. No, we're back, Charles. Good to see you. We're we're ex- so excited to have Eric back for part two. This was a great chat. Yeah, we learned a lot about about him, about his process, and about the other projects he's worked on besides Dead Reckoning Part One and Two. Um, how do, how do you want to set this up? Yeah, I mean, just again, you know, Eric was on our two hundredth episode. If you haven't listened, I, I'm sure you have. I, I really hope you have listened to our two hundredth. If you haven't, go back and listen to it because uh, Tom Cruise showed up actually, uh, which was insane. Uh, but yeah, there's not really much to say other than it's just uh, yeah, there's more to get into with Eric. And again, there aren't really spoilers really because we try to get him and he he won't give them to us. So. I mean, I guess we were pretty respectful. I don't think we really pushed him that hard to get. Well, we get the spoiler as to whether or not we've been visited. Oh, that's true. Aliens. We find out. We find. We get the spoilers on on aliens. Yeah. So you're gonna want to stick around for that. <laughs> <laughs> uh, before we get into it, if you'll permit me, Charles, I just got to get my shout outs in order here. Yes, so please. I want to give a shout out to obviously Jeremy Dillon and his podcast, My Favorite Album. Obviously, check him out, and not just the episodes we're on, but listen to those, too, if you would be so kind. Also, John B., uh, Elvis Ripley, and Suchet. Thank you guys so much. We would not be able to do this podcast without you. And without further ado, here we go, Eric Jenderson, part two. There is a good anecdote of something you've seen in the trailer. That shot that I referenced of you know going of that sort of John Ford shot of all the mercenaries on the horseback. We were shooting that scene. We we're in the empty quarter of the Arabian Desert, and and this is a sequence that as originally conceived of happens early in the film. And uh, we were in between takes. We just done one take of this. We were in between takes, and one of those riders walked up to Tom. And introduced himself and said, uh, "Mr. Cruz, uh, I am uh, I am one of the writers of the horses. I am I am from Spain, and uh, this is something. It is a family tradition. This is what we do for five generations. What five generations? You riding horses in movies? See, see, for five generations. I mean, it's like goes back to the silent era. See, see, this is something we are very proud of in my family. But I must say, Mr. Cruz, uh, what we are doing here today it is." I mean, this is this is going to make a fantastic third act of your movie. And Tom almost did a spit take. Third act. This is kind of the introduction of my character. <laughs> like this, <laughs> this is where we start. Is opposed. He, this guy assumed this must be the climax of the movie. No, no, no. This, is, this is just this is just the beginning. And that's another thing that's so delightful about this franchise is that you know. Where you you start at a place where m- most people you would have no place else to go, and then you go a lot farther. Well, speaking to that, it, it sounds from what from what we've talked, you know, we've talked to people, and and it sounds like this these are probably the last two that McCory will do, although you know he has said that before, I'm sure. Um, but is there kind of a, a a sense of culmination or finality to what you guys are working on that feels satisfying? I guess in terms of the franchise and also McCory's, you know, profound involvement in said franchise. The only thing I can say about that is that at, at the end, James Bond dies. Oh my God. Those <laughs> nanobots. <laughs> Curses. Yeah. Um, <laughs> no, I mean, who the hell knows? Right. Um, it's never, it, and it's never is about that or should it be about that? It, it it really is always, always for all three of us, in every way, 
in a general way, in a macro and a micro way about serving the story. And, about, and, and in this case, in the case of Mission, thank God, that means serving character, serving, serving the, these characters and their journeys. You know, the thing that distinguishes the, I think, the, the franchise so much from some of the other action franchises is this, is feeling. It's emotion, sense of, of care, how much we care about them and, and how much we care about how much they care about each other. And it goes back to the first film, you know, De Palma's film is, it's amazing. I mean, it, we were not able to dwell on it, but what launches Ethan Hunt as a character is the loss of his team. And he doesn't have a lot of time to mourn it, but the, the effect of that, that narcissistic wound on his character is profound. And it's amazing, right? Because it's, it's emotionally based, it's not plot-based. It's not, it's not just information, it's, it's, it's a feeling uh, of, of tremendous and violent loss that, uh, that you know, he has to redeem. Yeah, it's a, I think it's underrated how how emotional that first movie is. I mean, just that Truly. that aquar breaking out of the aquarium restaurant, the yeah. the you know that just all that, that 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 sequence is incredibly emotional. The way that it builds yeah. and he gets out of there, and and then also before when he calls in the in the phone booth and he's so upset about everybody. Yeah, it's yeah. So on the one hand, you have this remarkably difficult character of Ethan Hunt, who's this Teflon guy, who's just this superhero cognitive superhero physical superhero that's so unbelievable but he's so grounded in feeling and this sense of what is motivating him and why and how much he cares and it's interesting i mean it's a it, in a way that's a real it's a real analog for tom himself and his approach to you know the business and storytelling and entertaining audiences I mean, his his the level of dedication and the fervent his fervent need to do this is so genuine it's really kind of remarkable never seen anything like it so your your usual writing process as you said before is you've got some you got kind of the idea in your head and you you get an opening image and then you then you're off now with dead reckoning part two and a lot of research and a lot of research okay but dead reckoning part two i got to imagine that process was very different because i assume they come They've got on a board or whatever. They've got their. We got this set piece here, this set piece here, this set piece here. We got to hit these points. We, we're already. We've already had these characters around for a little, a little while, so we've got stuff like. What was that? How is that different for you coming in there and and starting that writing process? Was it still the same thing? Was it like opening the image? Did you come up with something like that, or was it? Are you kind of working within a different framework? How does that? differ from your usual process yeah it is different in that you have there, there are these certain like marks you, you know that you have to hit and there's there's this set piece that happens here and there's this set piece that happens here and they all have to be an organic part of the story you have to get to them for all the right reasons without contrivance you know and sometimes it's a matter of well we actually don't know yet how that fits into the story and so it, it's there's a lot of reverse engineering in the storytelling with with me and McHugh and and Tom. It's it, and but we know that going in, you know. But it, that is very very contrary to the way most stories are created, where you have complete freedom. You do you know whatever the hell you want, and we can do that too. In between, as long as we're getting to that place where we need to be, and getting there for all the right reasons, getting there without contrivance. Well, you brought up research. And I think Macquarie said this on their 200th, is that you have this kind of well of um, information about ships and naval and military history. And so how did that serve you, I guess, in these? I mean, we've seen biplanes and yeah. submarines and things in these trailers. Yeah. Can you speak to that? I, well, I just I grew up sailing in San Francisco Bay in the Pacific and uh, doing a lot of offshore sailing. California and sailed to Hawaii and used dead reckoning actually to get to Hawaii. Wow. <laughs> and so, yeah, sailing uh, and the sea has been an important part of my life. Charles is a sailor too, actually. Oh, yeah. He doesn't do shit like that, but he's, yeah. <laughs> I was more, uh, I grew up sailing dinghies and, and racing. Yeah. More so, uh, not, not keel boats as much. Right. Well, my dad had a, it ended up requiring this really remarkable boat that was it was a looters 44 that was it was and there were there were i guess six of them 
that were made from wooden specks in fiberglass for the Naval Academy mm -hmm. for Annapolis. And they were turned into, they were originally yawls and they were turned into these 47 foot sloops. And that's where I grew up sailing. Uh, and we campaigned the boat and raced it throughout San Francisco Bay and then offshore. And I did the transpack and whatever it was, 78 or 77. I think odd years or even years, I can't remember. Yeah, so I mean, yeah, that whole thing, uh, the sea has been a, an important part of my life. But I did not come up with the title. Uh, I was the first one to say that's got it. That's got to be it. Dead wreck. I mean, I just, I just lost. I actually think it was. I think it might have been Heather who thought of the title for Dead Reckon. Is that McCory's wife? Is that what you said? Yes. Yeah. 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 Wow, that's cool. Can you recall? I know you can't really talk about the new ones. So, but it, it, do you know? Going back to like going from set piece to set piece, can you recall like a, a situation in Rogue Nation and for Fallout or even Ghost Protocol? Where they were like, we've got this set piece, and then we've got this set piece, but we have no idea how to get to there. Like, was there any situation like that that you can recall? That just sounds like what we call Tuesday, you know? I mean... <laughs> I was going to say, is that every... It really, it really is. <laughs> that's, that's every conversation. But, like, was there, like, a specific... I don't know, can you um, remember how some of those things are... are um, how that, that problem-solving happens, what that process is? Just not a very exciting answer. It Again, it comes back to just... We just talk it out. We just get on the phone for those, and we would just talk talk it out and continue to. Well, what if this happened? What if this happened? Well, you know what? It's if you use this, and it's an invariably, usually, just as a, there would be a moment where you know, after thirty minutes, Chris would say, "What? I got it. I'm on," and he hang up and then write it up and then <laughs> send me pages. So are you, you, you're just working, you're just minding your own business, working on your own projects. Yeah. And then you get a call from McCory and he's frantically like trying to figure out some crisis on the set of Fallout or something. And you're like, okay, I'll just listen to McCory talk for a little while. Do you just like do the dishes while he's talking or what? Sometimes, How does sometimes, but you have to keep in mind that, you know, we're doing a lot of stuff together. And when he's in, when he was in production on Rogue and on Fallout, as his friend and sort of brother and partner i'm i'm very aware that my my buddy's off doing that right you know i think if, if it's a day of the week i know what they're i kind of know what they're shooting i'm aware of it i'm so i'm it's always in the back of my mind you're so you're kind of on call almost just as much on call as a as a trusted friend is at, you know at all times and the the thing for seven and eight for part one and part two it just it got formalized as far as the studio was concerned Right. Well, yeah, I was going to say, I mean, you're a trusted friend, but you, you know, do you have more obligation in these next two? Are you still sort of serving in the same capacity? Oh, no, it's a it's a lot more. I mean, I'm you know, it's it's OK. It's balls to the wall, you know, hands to the keys writing. We're writing stuff and throwing it back and forth to each other for. But, you know, an awful lot of seven was shot when I showed up and then it was doing a lot of interstitial work. With seven, and then with eight, when once we got to a certain point with seven, it's just like we know we're going with eight, and so we just kind of took a run at doing an actual draft of what it would be, and of course changed radically, as it always will. Right, and that's in a, in a sense now I've, I've come to realize as it always should, because the results are always generally so amazing. Did you ever think when you were in that little room in Park City? That one day you and Christopher McQuarrie would be dangling Tom Cruise off of things. No, who could who could ever? I mean, really, <laughs> right? And it's, but what I really love about it is I've always thought that that this particular franchise, because I watched the show when I was a kid with my dad, you know, and who didn't love it? It, it was unique, and I don't know, you know, how they even thought of it. It's just such a fantastic and fascinating idea for a, a franchise but i always thought that that is this sort of that's the brass ring sine qua non as being a screenwriter and having to sit down with a blank piece of paper and say fuck now what do we do you know to to begin the new one after nothing is left on the table i mean who could imagine where are we going to go after road nation we're we going to go after fallout you know which i think is really kind of a i think it's a masterpiece film I, I in storytelling, Fallout is, I think, a really extraordinary film. And then where do you go? And the challenge for a storyteller is it's immense, you know, and, and 
it's such a privilege to be able to have to be to be asked to participate in that and come you you be the storyteller with us that's going to help solve the the impossible well as a friend and collaborator of macquarie's has it been rewarding to see him grow as a storyteller and an artist which i think he does with these movies on such a massive scale i mean it's pretty impressive to see him you know and even and even incorporating things that he contributed to to Top Gun, it's like it's a pretty amazing kind of trajectory on a on a truly unbelievable scale where artistry and technical accomplishment are going hand in hand. Right. Yeah. There, there's nothing more gratifying uh, because you know Chris has got a certain strength of character uh, that's I think fairly unusual, and that he is he really is egoless about what he does. It's and he's so passionate about. It. And we, you know, I, I think that's the thing that really sparked us off at Sundance is that we kind of looked in each other's eyes and we realized, wow, you know, hail fellow, well met. We're, we both do this and tell stories because we absolutely love it. It's just, it's what gets our heart, heart pounding. And watching him being open to his own learning and his own experience as he innovates stuff and then the lessons he learns from mistakes and it's continuing to, he's just is burgeoning. You know, as a storyteller and as a human being, and so it's very gratifying to see that happen with a friend of yours. You know, and to collaborate. Yeah. There's nothing quite like it, and I'm learning a tremendous amount too. I mean, working on a, any kind of story, I think, with Tom, who has a you know a, a half a, a century of working in this business and and being again utterly devoted to the principle of what we're doing. That's the only reason he's doing it. He loves storytelling. And watching him and being being open to his barometer or being sensitive to his barometer about what what's the problem here? What because now I've learned that there is a problem, or there's at least a solution, or there's a way of doing it that's clearer or that's more incisive or more moving, uh, more appropriate. That's it's helped me enormously as a storyteller. I'll, I'll apply all of these lessons to the everything I do in that for sure and certain. And you know, there are a lot of things that are going on. At the same time, in parallel uh, in projects that in between, you know, like on the weekends, I mean, I'll be able to move another project ahead a little bit because we've got a lot of stuff in the pipeline. Some stuff that we've done a while ago and some and a lot of next projects. Wow. And you were, correct me if I'm wrong, the showrunner of Band of Brothers? I, we, there was not a, an official showrunner. Uh, I guess the, sort of the closest thing my title or my position was lead writer and supervising producer and then there was a line producer who it was like the the job the classical job of showrunner was divided into uh, the work of three people pretty much on band but my job was lead writer and supervising producer my job was to i wrote the bible for the series did all of that initial research and you know broke it into its episodes and then i was able to pick and choose which episodes i wanted to specifically write myself which was the first the middle and the last one and then i supervised the writing of all the other scripts are you involved in this new one the air masters of the air yeah no, oh, no. Okay. and i chose not to be involved in the pacific either just because i i, I thought there there would be there was a different approach that i wanted to take to the pacific uh than what they ultimately chose and part of it part of the problem was there was a rights issue with a particular piece of ip that i thought would have been a more appropriate way to tell the story and cl a little bit closer in a way to band of brothers in that if you're going to tell the story of the pacific theater which involves so many different uh units you know navy marine air sea air army you got to come up with a way to tell it that Anybody who served in the Pacific can watch that and say, yeah, that's what it was. And that's what it was like for me, as opposed to just focusing on one one particular unit. With band, we had, because the story took us from training in the, in the States all the way to the Eagle's Nest, it did feel like you told the whole story of the European theater of operations by telling the story of one unit. But you can't really do that with the Pacific because there are so many, so many different participating branches of, of service there. No, so so band was was it for me? That was a. Um, I mean, that project was pretty massive. It was a huge deal. I mean, it's still you know. What, what did, were you? Was 
because Tom Hanks was a big producer on that. Was he was he involved much in that process? One hundred percent. I mean, for the first, really, the first roughly six months, uh, once it was decided that we, that's what we were going to do. Steven Spielberg had uh, the option to uh, another Stephen Ambrose book called Citizen Soldiers, and Tom had Band of Brothers, and they didn't want to have competing projects. And they looked at both stories and they realized that one was very anecdotal, Citizen Soldiers, and Band of Brothers told this one amazing story of you know from soup to nuts. And so they decided to do that. And they, once HBO agreed, I was the first one brought on board. They, they needed someone to lead the, the storytelling effort. And so I, I went out there and we talked about it and I was hired. And I, the, for the first six months, it was really just me and Tom. I was uh, spending time with major winners in Hershey, Pennsylvania and some of the other uh, veterans. And I had the the gift of all of the material that Winters had collected over the years. He was sort of the nexus for Easy Company. And the publication of Ambrose's book had also caused so many of the members of Easy Company to re-recall things and dig back into their memories. And they'd send stuff to Winters. He was so he just had this massive amount of material. I mean, I went back to Charlotte. I was in Charlotte at the time with like uh I think the box is stacked up to about seven feet against the wall of material I have, you know, after action reports, S2 reports, everything. So I just, I started from scratch and I, I spent the first three months just being there, learning everything every single day until it felt like the experiences of Easy Company were lived in me like my own memories. And then I started to break it down and do the Bible. And then it was just, you know, calling Tom up and saying, you won't believe what I just discovered. <laughs> it's like it's, it's such an embarrassment of riches and, and gave him the Bible. And at that point, we we realized, you know, really had a show and then brought on other writers because it all, was all going to have to be done simultaneously and then and then got to work. But the really amazing anecdotal part of that, because I, I to this day, I can't go to a, a meeting in L.A. without the first five minutes is about Band of Brothers. They want to say, oh, that's my favorite show. Tell me, how did that actually ha happen? It's so amazing. And I always tell them exactly the same thing. And this is strictly true. Chris Albrecht, who was running HBO at the time, had determined that there was no executive at HBO who was qualified to give notes. And his idea was you, you get the right people together as storytellers and filmmakers, and let them the fuck alone. They know exactly what they're doing. They're not, they don't want to make a bad show. And he had Tom, he had me, and Gary Getzman, and then we had this group of writers that were remarkable. We didn't get one single note from HBO. Wow. 10 hours of script. Wow. Not a single note. And I, so I always tell, I'm always being asked by a producer, how did it happen? How did, why is it so good? Well, this is why. <laughs> And their response is always the same. There's always a sort of pause and you say, oh, well, that'll never happen again. <laughs> they didn't take away from it what you were trying to put out there. Didn't take away. <laughs> no, because it, they, they're processing and thinking, well, that's terrifying. No, we can't. We, that'll never We can't do that. We have to give notes. <laughs> Eric, you might not be uh, endearing yourself to these executives you're meeting with when you tell them the story. <laughs> you know, but it, but it, but it is true, and it's like you know what kind of a real genius Albrecht was. And in, in no, I mean, it can always go wrong. You know, his, but his because his idea was you get just exactly the right team and you let them do what they do. Yeah, and you just don't interfere. You don't don't mess with it. And that's that made it an utterly unique experience in everybody's experience of working in Hollywood. Nothing like that had ever happened. I have to ask you a couple of quick questions based on projects that you haven't, that have not as yet seen the light of day. You wrote a project about Werner von Braun, who is a, who's a figure who has always been fascinating to me. And I wanted to know, in, in your estimation, was he a Nazi or was he Nazi-ish? A Nazi-esque. Oh, Nazi-esque, okay. I okay. mean, I, no, I, no, I think, and, and by the way, just to be clear, <laughs> I have not written a project about him. I was I was involved in developing a project, which is an ongoing thing. Okay, it's it's such a difficult question, and I I think I think that for von Braun, it was a matter it was the exigency of being a German scientist at that time in 
in the midst of that regime. Not, I'm not, I'm not making an excuse for him, but I think that he didn't give a shit about the politics or the polemics of what was happening around him, which is really irresponsible. But you see that so often in people in, in the sciences. I did write a film about Jacques Cousteau. And similarly, you know, here's a guy who his whole attitude was he's aware of what's going on around him and in, did, in fact, work for the resistance in a really amazing, there's an amazing anecdote about a job he did for the resistance while he was developing the alkaline. But in general, his attitude about what was happening around him was when he was told, look, the world's at war. Why aren't you, you're, you're trying to figure out how to breathe underwater. You need to be involved in this. The world is at war. And his response was, if 70% of the world is underwater, how can the world be at war? You know, so his, he just had this completely different way of looking at it. Wow. And to some extent, I think that was true with Von Braun. And Von Braun, you know, he, he had his own trajectory and his own ambitions and nothing was going to get in his, in his way. Well, okay. You also did a project about Majestic 12. Oh, yeah. And I want to know, are they here? Yeah. Are are we? No. Oh, well, are, wait a minute. Okay. Hold on a second. Let's be. Are the alien? Are the aliens among us? Among I have us? some suspicions about Charles. Yeah, on this planet. <laughs> Most of them are running studios. Okay. <laughs> they don't like to give. No- they do like to give notes. Yeah. Um. I, are they among us? No. My my. I I I haven't given that much thought. I don't. I really don't. I don't know about that. I don't really think so. Are UFOs real? Or have have we been visited? Have there been incidents? Are, is this stuff the real deal? In my estimation, and I went I went deeper into my research for that project than I did for band, actually. And and <laughs> I think the answer is yes, absolutely, one hundred percent. Wow. Okay. Yeah. Wow. And was this project all in this like kind of the sixties and? project blue book and all that yeah it was actually before that the the, the story oh, okay. um was about it it actually starts in 1942 there's a sequence in 1942 but most of it takes place from 47 to 52 because that was the Roswell, yeah that so, was the golden yeah. age that's when the phenomenon were everywhere i mean it was astonishing what happened from 47 to 52 and I, yeah, I went pretty deep into that and into the world of General Nathan Twining, who was the first Air Force uh, General of the uh, Joint Chiefs of Staff and his involvement in all of that and who the individuals were who were put together to to figure out what was happening and what we're going to do about it and how to compartmentalize it and how to use disinformation to to keep it secret. Was the Battle of Los Angeles... Uh, an alien visitation that's the that's the 1942 sequence that's oh, okay story yeah yeah and and man i don't know uh i i don't i don't know what the hell it was and nobody does but it certainly wasn't a weather balloon it wasn't a blimp it was something else again another tragedy if this project would fall into our inbox i've gotta say <laughs> that's an old that's an old old script that's a that's something i i did for abc a long time ago i mean that's maybe God, 15, 16 years ago, I think. Was it like post X Files? Everybody wanted a alien thing. No, it just it came out of the blue. It didn't have anything to do with with X Files or any of that stuff. It was a a producer who really was anxious to delve into all this stuff and to look at the history. And I came on board, and then yeah, you know, went way down the rabbit. Well, I know we're running out of time, Charles. Should we? I mean, we've got the hair question. Yeah, I think we got to ask though for the movie rankings. Yeah, can we can we get your movie ranking and and feel oh, free to include right. seven and eight in this? <laughs> yeah, how can you include films that aren't finished yet? You know how good they're gonna be. <laughs> yeah, I do. Um, gosh, how do you how do I do this? Um, I, well, my honest, let's just deal with the rankings of the films that have been made. Okay. Set aside okay, Bad Reckoning fine. Part One and Part. Fine, okay. fine, fine. My ranking of mission of the franchise would be Fallout, Rogue, one, then Ghost Protocol, then three, and then two. Okay. Yeah. That's pretty close to ours, actually. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, they're all pretty good movies. I mean, and where do you think seven and eight are? Go- I mean, are seven and eight just going to wipe the floor with the rest of them? Is that the idea? That's sort of the idea. 
<laughs> you know, I mean, but no, to be honestly, if you're looking at what, what's the apotheosis of this story of the IMF, of Ethan Hunt's journey from the beginning, what would that be? You know, what, and that's, it's the, it's sort of the ultimate, how do we do the next mission? Because it's like, well, what is the, what, is, what, what, what is the villain that's going to be faced here? What, what are the stakes going to be? What's the emotional cost of this going to be on, on him and the rest of the team members? Um, so yeah, it's, it's, it has, it, it's building honestly on everything that came before that can truthfully be said with Luther, with Benji, certainly with Ethan, everything that's come before, all the consequence. And it does it in a very honest, uh, and I think very compelling way and very emotional. We're going to make those dates. July's coming up pretty soon, Eric. Yeah, it is. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it is. <laughs> Here it comes. Here it comes. <laughs> well, we hope that, that after seven comes out, maybe you can come back and we can talk about it and then do the same for eight. Oh, sure. That'd, oh, that'd be really fun, actually. Okay. Yeah. Okay, great. We'd love that. We're back. How you doing, Charles? I'm great. Uh, that I mean, yeah, he was just a joy to speak with, and I, something I really loved was that him talking about uh, the launch of the Ethan character and how the death of his whole team in the first movie kind of defines him. I just thought that was really interesting talking about the emotions of the first movie and and how it, it's like, it, yeah, I don't know, just like defining his character not by something that was exposition, but something that was really emotional. Um, and you know we love that first movie. Yeah, I mean, that first movie doesn't get enough credit for some reason. So anytime we can weave it back into these movies, we love that. Um, what else? What else struck you, Charles? It was really cool to hear about the the writing of Band of Brothers. That was a process that I never, I've never read about or known about at all. And just knowing about him spending all that time with Tom Hanks. And he spent time with, with the two Toms, you know? I mean, that's, that's a way to spend your career is to work extensively with Tom Hanks and then Tom Cruise. Not many people can say that. And also Gar Gary Goetzman, who uh, inspired the weird little kid in Licorice, Licorice Pizza. Pizza. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, he must have been hanging out a lot. He probably, he probably heard some of those stories Yeah, probably. Before, before Paul Thomas Anderson did. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, I, I, you know, I just, he's such an interesting guy. And it's, I mean, I don't know. Yeah, fascinating. His... The, it seems like you can see the subjects like he, you know, it's like we talked about before. Everybody is like a the auteur theory is a thing for directors or whatever. But like we've talked about how it applies to different crew people, too. Like, like we you know, Michael Kaplan, the costume designer who we spoke with, who is I would consider like an auteur costume designer. And like, you know, everyone brings themselves to their art. And this all of this stuff is very him. You can tell what Eric writes is uh yeah, it's just awesome. And so it was cool. Of course, what, we got to talk about aliens. We, oh, we, yeah, that's right. We, Sorry. We got to I mean, talk yeah. about the aliens. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, I mean, and it, it wasn't like, it's not like, he, he was not joking. He was, no. it, it really feels like we've been visited by aliens. <laughs> I, I've often believed it. Charles and I have stopped at a UFO themed um, stop and shop, kind of a quickie mart uh, on the way to Vegas. So we yes. know that they're alien fresh jerky. Alien fresh jerky. Yes, oh, yeah. that's right. Yeah, but yeah, I mean, I it, listen. I believe him. he did a, so much research for this project, which I don't think actually ever moved forward. But yeah, he knows. But he was doing God's work doing this research for us. Yeah, yeah. Because I needed to know the answer, and I'm happy to hear that. Am I happy? I am happy to hear because I think if we've been visited, but nothing, we haven't been destroyed, right? So that's good. That's good news. It sounds like he doesn't think they're walking among us. Which yeah. He did not seem to think that, yeah. and that's also good. Yeah, we don't need like a they live type situation going on here on Earth. No, no, um, no. Yeah. So anyway, I, I just yeah loved hearing about that, and uh, I think that's about it for me. You? Yeah, I mean, I, I'm gonna just take over some of your your legwork here and and oh good and urge urge everyone to go visit the Patreon and sign up for the Patreon Patreon dot dot com forward slash light the fuse. We have great incentives for you to join. We've got new episodes every week. We're going to record one right after we're done here for you. 
Uh, we did a great one about uh, we got we had some Oscar reactions from some of your favorite people involved with Top Gun Maverick. Yeah, you got some exclusive quotes in there from yeah. uh, from Christopher McQuarrie and Eddie Hamilton and and Bruckheimer and, yeah. and Bruckheimer yeah. also, right? Yeah, yeah. So we did a whole Patreon episode about that. That was awesome. Yeah, and then um, obviously visit our website, lightthefusepodcast dot com, and we've got some great show notes there. Go to go into the show. You'll see all the show notes, photos, videos, everything we talk about will be on that episode guide. And yeah, T Public, right, Charles? Tell tell them how to get to the T Public page. Okay, yeah, <laughs> it's complicated. Uh, the T Public page. Uh, well, I think I've I think I've memorized the address, which is a little bit tricky. Not too bad. I think it's tpublic.com slash user slash light the fuse pod. I think okay. that's what it is. Okay. That's not too bad. But if that's, you know, tough to remember, you can always go to our website and go to the merch tab and there's a link there that takes you to it. And uh, what else? Wait, wait, so, uh, hey, hey, we got to tell people to like, subscribe, rate, and review. I, mean, I got to do Drew's part now. This is. <laughs> <laughs> Please tell your friends about the show, spread the word, follow us on social media. We're at light the fuse pod on Instagram and Twitter. And uh, we also lurk around a bit on the uh, Mission Impossible subreddit. You can find us there posting some uh, fun stuff as, as well. And uh, Do we know what next week is? Uh, next week we do have uh, the VFX producer from Rogue Nation. Um, it, Maricel Pagulian. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to butcher her last name. Maricel Pagulian. Is that right? Yeah, that sounds right. She is she is a trip. She was awesome. She had great stories. She was so funny. And you're going to love that one. She was a VFX producer and associate producer on Rogue Nation. It's a great follow-up, actually, to our horrible Rogue Nation deleted scenes episode because we get it is. her to confirm some things yes. from that episode. So Yeah. So we, we got – she was able to clarify for us which – you know, so a couple of those scenes that were filmed – so, yeah, it is a great follow-up to our Deleted Scenes episode uh, for, for Rogue Nation. But before we go, you have shout-outs, too, right? Thank you for reminding me. I have, I have to give a special thank you to Derek Klingle and Sonia Miranda. Uh, thank you, Derek and Sonia, for making this episode possible. I also want to credit our editor and mixer, Luke Burson, and our composer, Kevin Blumenfeld, and our intern, Amber Cohen. Thank you all so much. Thank you out there, all of you, for listening and for commenting and for uh, you know liking and reviewing and supporting the show and, and spreading the word. Uh, it means so much to us. Uh, and I think, is that it? I think that's it. We'll be back next week. Marisol, she is an absolute delight. Totally uncensored and amazing. So You're going to love it. Come on back for that. <laughs> Thanks again for listening, everyone. Before we go, another mission, should you choose to accept it, please rate, review, and subscribe wherever you listen to podcasts. And remember that you can follow us on Twitter and Instagram at LightTheFusePod, and email us questions or comments at LightTheFusePodcast at gmail.com. This message will self-destruct in five seconds.